the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, exploring the weapon shop of Golden Age greatness with Drake and Flint. You can get there from here if you have a map, says Bain cartographer Randy Asplund, even if there is a parallel universe. A pulp of paperbacks and London underground monster, the winner of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Contest, plus part 13 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have Hammer's Slammer's author David Drake and Ring of Fire series creator Eric Flint together for a discussion on a new book they co-edited on the works of A.E. Van Vogt. This book is transgalactic, and it is out in mass market paperback. Also on the podcast, we have Bain cartographer Randy Asplund, who has created many a map for Bain books. Randy is a man who knows his east from his west and his roll from his yaw. And, of course, we continue our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom with Part 13. First, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. On the website, beginning June 15th, is a nonfiction article that is kind of cool. It's all about the life and death of the NASA Missions Operations Computer. That's the computer that took our astronauts to the moon and to space and lasted a surprisingly long time in the modern computer era. So is that what the article that's called R.I.P.M.O.C. is about? Yeah, yeah. That is uh, M.O.C. is Missions Operations Computer, I believe. Terry Burleson is the author. He was a mission control specialist for a long time at NASA. Now he's an author and journalist, so he gives us an inside history of this that amazing computer. It's a fun article. Sounds exciting. And uh, don't forget, we also have free fiction from John Lambshead that's set in the universe of his upcoming contemporary fantasy, Wolf in Shadow. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a cool book. It's set in modern London, uh, but with lots of monsters in it. That's going to be a July book. Oh, and we're proud to bring our readers uh, the winner of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award for this year. That story is Lamplighter Legacy by Patrick O'Sullivan. Now, this contest is kind of a big deal. The winner gets published on the website, of course, but the winner is announced at the International Space Development Conference. This year it was in San Diego. There's this like big banquet, and we give out the award, and it's, it's really cool. It's put on by the National Space Society. I got to give out the award last year, and I was sitting at the table with Buzz Aldrin. Wow. Yeah, he's not as crazy as you might think from seeing him on television. Really? That's good to know. Yeah. So check out that uh, cornucopia of free fiction and nonfiction at Bain.com. And you know what, Laura? What, Tony? We do this every month at Bain.com. We certainly do, and it's all free. Yep. Free as a bird. And this bird will never change. Go to Bain.com and check that out. And look for all the June titles from Bain Books and your favorite bookseller now. A.E. Van Vaux was born in 1912 in Canada, the son of Russian Mennonites. His father was a lawyer, however, and his childhood was peripatetic and unhappy. He broke into science fiction in 1939 with a story in the pages of astounding magazine called The Black Destroyer. This was the astounding of legendary editor John W. Campbell. And Campbell said of Van Vaux, The son of a gun gets hold of you in the first paragraph, ties a knot around you, and keeps it tied in every paragraph thereafter, including the ultimate last one. Van Vogt's stories continue to grace Astounding and other SF pulps throughout the 40s and 50s and even into the 70s and 80s, and he died in California from Alzheimer's in 2000. Uh, In addition to his pulse-pounding prose style, Van Vogt is known for the sense of universe-level, grand-scale wonder he evoked in his stories, for the idea that the human mind is capable of far greater development and that it may even contain hidden powers waiting to be released, and for his ability to create worlds that seem to be symbols he has dug up from his subconscious somehow and tied together in a way that makes sense. Van Vogt's uh, Transgalactic is out now in mass market paperback from Bain. 
This is a very large book at over 600 pages that pulls together a huge thematic selection of Van Vogt's best work. This book features a wonderful new cover by Bob Eggleton, by the way. Transgalactic pulls together all of the Clane of Lynn stories by Van Vogt, including the stories from his book Empire of the Atom and many others. It also contains the Mission to the Stars stories featuring Van Vogt's mixed men, the Delians. With me today to discuss A.E. Van Vogt are writers Eric Flint and David Drake. Eric is the creator of the 1632 series of alternate history novels and several other series, including the Boundary Hard SF series. The latest entry in that series, Portal, by Eric and Reiki Spore, is just out in hardcover. David Drake is the creator of the legendary military SF series, Hammer Slammers, and of the ongoing RCN series featuring Space Naval Officers Daniel Leary and Estelle Mundy. The latest entry in the RCN series is The Road of Danger, which is recently out in mass market paperback. David and Eric have also collaborated on a whole sequence of novels and stories in the Belisarius series, as well as entries in the General series. By the way, the latest General series novel, The Heretic, is recently out in hardcover, and that was co-written by me, Tony Daniel and David Drake. So we've all uh, written in that series, except for Hank. So let's start with Van Vogt uh, and the sense of wonder. You two write in your introduction, that is, uh, David and Eric, you write in your introduction to Transgalactic that Van Vogt has the ability to suggest vastness beyond comprehension. I believe those were your words. What did you mean by that? Just basically that. I mean, the, the mixed man. Um, right away, you've got a human empire of tens of thousands of suns. I mean, you know, blam. Uh, this at a time that the population of the U.S. was probably in the order of, I don't know, 150 million or thereabouts. I, I mean, it's just boom, out there. So and, a, a physical um, vastness? Uh, well, that too. The, the line in, um, okay, in Weapon Chop the Visher, which we did not include, but we could have, you have the viewpoint, which is sort of a, a it is a, a person, but it is sort of a universal viewpoint. And as you have basically this reporter creating the universe, you know, he, he is the Big Bang, in effect. And you have the viewpoint character saying, this is the world, this is the race that will rule the Savagram. What the hell is a Savagram? But, but it's just thrown out there. I mean, there, so it's not just physical and it's not just temporal. There's just so much implied um, in all Van Vogt's stuff. Uh, it's, it's amazing. The implication so of, of, of a larger reality that we're maybe not even capable of comprehending? Yes. How does he do that, Eric? Uh, so, I mean, a lot of people can just throw out terms, but he makes them evocative. Um, <laughs> that's one of those. Um, the way he does it is by being A.E. Van Vogt. Um, I'm, I'm not, I know that sounds like a stupid answer, but it really was what he did supremely well. It, it's It's tricky to pull it off. I wouldn't try it. And I don't know many authors who can do it successfully. There's been a number who've tried and flopped, but uh, it honestly is hard to explain. It just he does it, and he does it because you know, in book after book after book, it's not just like he hit it once. I just I just thought that at his best, he told really good stories. His prose style seems to me to be something like something that would hook a 14 year old. Uh, just, just constantly. He's got 800 words, I believe, was his rule, and he and he had a climax of some sort coming on, or a, or a twist, or a. Mm -hmm. um, and it does seem to rush forward in a in a really compelling way um, that maybe gets forgotten a little bit in our age of uh, of deep character development and such. When you're reading Bad Vote, you often think you know what's happening, what's going along, and then suddenly it's like you fell through a trapdoor. 
And mm-hmm. everything you thought you knew is not right. It may be partly right. In fact, uh, there's this scene in uh, Mission to the Stars, included in Trat's Galactic, where the, uh, the hero is trapped by the bad guy, and he's, there's no possible way he could escape. However, he's wearing a, a matter transmitter suit. So he just grabs the bad guy and stuffs him into his chest, and he pops out somewhere else. And I often get that feeling reading, like uh, somebody grabs me and I pop out somewhere else. And what happened with, with a reading bad book? No, it, it all seems to make logical sense, and then, blam, something happened. And it, it's not that he's not faking it. I mean... Honest to God, I think the reason he's so successful at this is he believed it. I mean, that at some level, you're getting his belief in these amazing possibilities, the half-glimpsed things. This might be a good place for me to share my Van Vogt story, which is um, he's, he's the first science fiction writer I ever met, uh, and I met him at Chattacon in the late 70s. Uh, he invited there were several of us standing around and he invited us we all came into his room and he was brushing his teeth and uh, he started telling us about a dream he'd had uh, that was basically a science fiction story he was he was about to write and I got the feeling that he pulled a great deal um, however well constructed his work is he pulls a great deal out of his subconscious when he was writing um, it, it freaked me as a 12 year old it both you know uh, amazed me and freaked me out to have this experience, but um, it, it really felt like he was he was writing his dreams, and and when I read him afterwards, because I did come to him after I met him, that was the the image I had in my mind as, as this guy was telling me his dreams. Let's move on to uh, let's talk about Clane of Lynn, particularly. This is the huge uh, first chunk of uh, of Transgalactic. You you folks have collected. Uh, you guys have collected. All of these Clane of Lynn stories. This is one of those fallen futures of science fiction in which some technology, some technology has survived, but people have forgotten where it came from. And there's a sort of priestly know nothing class that has control of it, but doesn't really understand it. And a mutant is born into this world, like a, a, a genetic mutant. And because of who he is, Clane, who is this mutant, realizes some of the truth of what has happened to humanity, not all of it. We never really find out it entirely. I don't believe what happened. But uh, he proceeds to use this knowledge to accrete imperial power. And, and really the story is a story of the development of empire, uh, of, a, of a vast uh, human empire based on technology that no one, nobody completely understands. Uh, some have likened the structure of Klein to I, Claudius, Robert Gray's book. What, do you want to comment on that, Dave? Uh, structure, no, I don't think it's anything like the structure. The character, however, it's not at all unlikely that Van Vogt was thinking of Graves, when he, you know, Graves Claudius when he created his Klein. May I toss in something here? Because talking about uh, associations... It occurred to me when I was rereading stuff preparatory to this, um, this is very much the character of Lois Buchholz. Uh, yeah, I know. And has, has she explicitly acknowledged uh, connection? I, I, if I had a little more time, I would have asked her, but it just hadn't occurred to me till now. Can you explain what you mean? Oh, yeah. You, you have a a mutant who is, you know, in, in general, human, just sort of a deformed human, uh, very physically weak, but who's I brighter love David. than anybody. Can we back up a sec? You have a mutant born to a very, very prominent, highly placed, powerful family. Right, Miles, yeah. um, Miles yeah. for Kosigan in, in Louis Bujol's books. I see what you mean. Yeah. And, and both of them he is, although been, he is physically yeah. nothing much, He's smarter than not only anybody else around, but everybody else around. And, you know, that is very much the structure of both novels and, or both, you know, sets of novels. And, and I don't mean that it's impossible to develop something like that independently, but, um, I, 
I certainly I found Van Vogt a an influence on me, and it wouldn't uh, surprise me if Lois did also, but I haven't asked her. Oh, uh, let me say about Claudius and why I, I don't think... Claudius was indeed very smart and uh, a major scholar, but instead of it being a benefit to him, he kept getting screwed up because he was... Um, he was just too clever, and he was more interested in cleverness. You know, the famous line, and you, you see it quoted all over, mostly in titles, Hail Caesar, uh, we who are about to die salute you. What, as, you know, the gladiators saluted him before the games, and what's usually not said is what he, what happened then. He said, or not, uh, because... Most of them wouldn't die. And so they went on strike saying, okay, we've been pardoned for this battle, and we don't have to fight now. And they all sat down, and there was almost a riot. And, you know, he was grammatically correct, but he was an idiot to have said that, and it turned the populace, who already thought him weird, uh, even more against him. Now, that's not the sort of thing that Klain would have done. I think that stuff about Belisarius being influenced on the Clade stuff started with it, with David Knight. And I, I tend to distrust anything David Knight said about Van Vogt, since he despised Van Vogt's writing so much. The once, once referred to him as a pygmy who learned to use a typewriter or some phrase like that. I mean, there's a whole other story we could uh, we could explore, which is Damon Knight's sort of... Di- Critical dismantling of Van Vogt for no reason whatsoever. But let's uh, let's skip over that. There's so much better, you know, so much positive stuff we could say. Yeah. Let's talk about Van Vogt and his ideas about mental power for a bit. Um, this is a thread that seems to run through the 1940s and 50s science fiction. I, you know, you just see it poking up all the time. You don't see it so much these days, or or maybe there's a resurgence. I don't know. Uh, this is the idea that humans only use a portion of their minds and we can unlock all kinds of ability if we just take off our conceptual blinders. We can be geniuses and have ESP and telekinetic powers and, you know, change things with our mind, teleport, maybe become gods ourselves. This pops up a lot in the Klein stories and it's very evident in the mixed men stories. Van Vogt is said to have been influenced by the psychologist and linguist Alfred Korbsky, I believe is how you say his name, and his theory of gen general semantics where did this theme come from in van Vogt's work is it is it something he picked up from the air or did he bring it into science fiction and others picked it up from him the the fourth collection of um, charles fort's essays wild talents was about and it actually it tended to be called in the 50s it was called psi psi and campbell was pushing it hard in the 40s, it tended to be called wild talents, literally. And uh, again, Campbell was very strong on this sort of thing in in Astounding. And um, Do you think this was uh, just a hobby horse of John Campbell? Or was it something that was actually in the, you know, in the air of the time that he was picking up on? Well, I think in the air. But, but he was the most prominent... Uh, you know, supporter of it. He he was the editor who was most prominently supporting it, unless you want to say Ray Palmer. Yeah, my sense is kind of that it was just something that was in the air. And, I mean, it wasn't just Van Vogt. You tend to run across it in lots of authors in that period, and even into the 60s. What do you, what do you think it means as a... Why... How does it map onto our culture... If you want to put it that way, what what the heck is it an analogy for? Why does it move people to read stories about that stuff? Other than that, it would be really cool to have ESP. Maybe that's all it is. Um, I I think it's mostly um, wish fulfillment. I I don't know that there's anything really that significant you can read into it, other than um, it was kind of a whoopee. It's like. Mm-hmm interstellar intergalactic travel where it's just all basically hand-waving you know 
Um, and you know, next thing you know, you're zipping across intergalactic voids. I mean, a lot of science fiction in those days had that kind of um, 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 the, the plot works by the use of unobtainium um, of one kind or another. And I, I just think the the free use of supermental powers of one kind or another just to me sort of was part and parcel of all that. By the time you get to the end of the sixties. Um, one of two things has happened. First of all, a lot of that kind of, uh, call it spirit, if you will, just goes into fantasy. Because you get a huge explosion of fantasy. And science fiction becomes quite a bit more, I guess you could call it realistic. Or, <laughs> you know, less hand waving. You know, it's just tighter, by and large. I mean, and stories like that just aren't written much anymore if at all, unless somebody puts them in a fantasy setting. My point maybe would be that um, it seemed plausible before, and it doesn't seem as plausible now to encounter those, and, and that's why it, it doesn't seem science fiction anymore. And for me, that may be a lot to do with um, with Van Vogt's sort of critical reputation following falling for a while and, then, and now coming back up after we realize... Uh, that um, that a lot of that stuff was was really predictive in a way because we're we're coming back to that sort of, of feeling that that human mental powers are going to expand maybe in a different way than he he foresaw. This brings us to the question of Dianetics, um, which we should probably touch on. We know that Van Vogt was uh, very involved with the early days of Dianetics, and he and L. Ron Hubbard uh, knew each other in California and. Um, and John W. Campbell, they all introduced that thought uh, system in in the pages of Astounding in the in the fifties. This seems very related to this. Van, Van Vogt was in fact running the Dianetics operation in L.A. for eleven years, yeah. and that's the period that he he stopped writing and began devoting himself entirely to Dianetics. Now you said earlier, yeah. David, that um, that you thought he he really believed a lot of that the the belief itself. Oh, absolutely. Um, and do you think that this is part and parcel with his uh, developing Dianetics? And yes, uh, if you read his uh, what was it, Hank, uh, 1940, his uh, World Worldcon Guest of Honor speech, he's talking about that in 1940 or whatever it was, 4041, he was talking at that time about how he had improved his vision from, I think, 2800 to 2020 by the use of mental power. Apparently, Heinlein was trying to do the same thing uh, with some claimed success uh, to get back into the Navy. But this sort of thing really was a matter of serious belief from serious science fiction writers. And I don't think Van Vogt ever lost that. And that's good in the sense that when he writes something, he really believes it and he makes it believable to the reader because of his faith. Even if what he's talking is what I personally may think is BS, uh, he he makes it come across, he gives the reader the feel that, no, this is real. I don't understand it, but it's real. And that sure hit me when I was 13, 14, 15, uh, and first reading science fiction seriously, uh, because Mission to the Stars was either the first or the second science fiction book I bought. And this really made an enormous impact on me. Um it it's real because it's told for true. Let's talk finally uh, once again about that transgalactic sweep that Ben Vogt uh, brings to, into his work. Um, a huge range of authors, you two and Philip K. Dick and Gene Roddenberry, among many many others, uh, have have claimed him as as um, influences. So, do you have any final thoughts on this, Eric, uh, Dave? I, I got to be honest. I started reading Van Vogt really early, and I read him for a number of years. I never took 
him very seriously as far as the theories that he shoved into his works, even as a teenager. Um, I just thought they were generally really good stories. And, I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at something like Void, uh, Voyage of Space Beagle, uh, you know, the hero possesses this, you know, super science called Nexialism, and based on which he, you know, it's a heck of a, the stories are really good, but I never took yeah. it seriously. You know, I, it's just, it was kind of, I don't know how to put it. I read Van Vogt kind of like I read fantasy. He would have his, uh, same with the world of Nolle and, you know, the Nolle books, um, you know, where the guy had the magic powers of, of, of non-Aristotelian thinking by Korsivsky. And see, the thing is, I took quite a bit of philosophy in college. I knew perfectly well this was, at best, a crude, I don't know how to put it. I, I, I never took any of that very seriously. Um, and that's not the level in which I read Van Gogh's stories. It just, I thought he had a really wonderful ability to evoke a kind of, you know, what we talk about, transgalactic, grand scale, and scope of the stories. And then he would just charge ahead and, and, and tell stories that, like I said, I really read them more in the spirit in which I read fantasy than the spirit in which I read what I consider hard SF. Something like nexualism is like, a magic wand, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's, you read a fantasy novel and the wizard has a magic wand and with it he or she can do all kinds of things and, okay, I'll, I'll go along with that if the story's good. And that's kind of how I felt about Van Gogh's various hobby horses. Um, just, so uh, when we put buy... together this book, most of it I went back and, and I think David I don't remember which one was proposed, which one of the stories, but mostly we just wanted to put back in print really good stories he told that had fallen out of print. I mean, some of his stories had stayed more or less in print, but these had all fallen out pretty much. That's kind of how we put it together. But I think the less you look for depth in Van Vogt, the better off you are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how to put it. I mean, it, it's uh, I don't know what he himself thought of all this. But I think those books of his where he'd really delve into it, I, I think it got to be a problem with the Null A books because, you know, the underlying theory, whatever you call it, would, would just start tripping. I like those books less than I like most of us. And, and it was for that reason. It was, it, he seemed to be spending too much, uh, I don't know how to put it. it, it the, 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 the story seemed to be more about this, theoretical philosophy than about the story and I found it got a little turgid. Uh, thank you for uh, regrounding us in uh, in our blue collar roots here. <laughs> we just read it because it's good stuff. Uh, if I can throw in something on Eric's uh, yeah. position. Cause we come to it in sort of the opposite fashion. Uh, I have no ideology and I've always found and I've tried. Honest to God, I've tried. I find philosophy deeply boring uh but so that part of them thought never particularly touched me i don't think you can actually say it's fantasy though because i think at some level of uh, van vaught whether or not he understood it he and and i don't uh, this may not be true in the later um uh null a books uh, but I think he thought it was real at some level, even if he couldn't quite understand how it worked. And so I came to it as, here is this great story, and the the mechanism of the hardware doesn't really matter, because it isn't the mechanism of the story. And he he does get the vastness and... I really, um, I don't do as much of that as I would like to do because I don't think in those terms. But I sure appreciate it when I see it done well, and he did it wonderfully well. We've been talking about science fiction legend A.E. Uh -huh. Van Vogt. The book is transgalactic, all 600 pages of it, now out in mass market paperback from Bain Books. I want to thank David Drake and Eric Flint and Hank Davis for being with us. 
you can find links to their books and to Transgalactic at the uh, Bain.com website. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We've asked several of the people behind the making of Bain Books to reveal themselves, as it were. And today we have with us mapmaker of the Bain Universe cartographer and artist, Randy Asplin. Hi, Randy. Hi, Tony. Good to have you with us. Randy's maps have appeared in many Bain books over the years. Most recently, he has done the maps for High Fantasy Phoenix Rising, for Tom Crapman's upcoming Carrera sequel, Come and Take Them, for Steve White's Jason Thanow time travel books, and for the new entry in the general series, The Heretic, by David Drake and yours truly. Randy was a painting major at the University of Michigan, where he graduated. He's been a very active medieval reenactor as well, I believe. Uh, Randy, I think you said you always wanted to be an illustrator and artist within science fiction and fantasy. How did you prepare for that aspect of being an artist in your younger days, as it were? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I came into it from a kind of strange way, unlike comic books, which seems to bring in a lot of the other artists. Um, when I was in high school, I had my fantasies of, of being an aeronautical engineer, and I had my my interest in being an archaeologist. And then after I'd graduated high school and I started going to science fiction conventions, at my first science fiction convention, I discovered the art show there, and they had you know, an artist guest of honor walk in with some cover work, and, and I looked at it, and I thought, this is so cool. You know, here I was uh, in my second year of college as a fine arts major, and I thought, this is what I want to do. I love this genre. Um, I, I love doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm, I, I'm able to invent spacecraft and, and still paint griffins or dragons or whatever it is that comes up, and it just seemed tailor-made for for the rest of my life. So I started looking at how to build a career in it. Randy, how did you start doing uh, maps for Bain, and what are some of the the maps that you've worked on for Bain over the years? Well, um, I think it was a Lunacon, actually, uh, about maybe 1999 or so. Uh, I do remember it was a publisher party, and I was sitting on the floor, and I was talking about medieval reenactment. Um, I belong to the Society for Creative Anachronism, and uh, we put on armor and do tournament and, and battle fighting. It was uh, just a, a fluke that I happened to be sitting on the floor underneath some woman whose voice p- pipes up and says, Hey, I know you. I was the editor for the magazine that um, is uh, put out by our organization, and I had written some articles on uh, manuscript illumination, and she had been my editor for that. And there was Nancy Hanger, who was also working as an editor for Bain. And we struck up a conversation, and she already knew what I do, and she thought my calligraphic and manuscript illumin- illumination styles would work very well for some books that she was working on. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was doing my first map for an Eric Flint novel. I think that one came out in 2000, so it's quite a while ago. I did an awful lot of books that had Eric and various other authors attached to them. Um, a lot of books by people like Dave Freer and uh, David Weber. Um, I've done some by Rick Spur, and um, there was a Mercedes Lackey or two in there. Uh, goes on. Steve White, good author. John Dalmas. Some really fun maps. I, I, uh, I got to really stretch myself because, you know, one day I would be doing a realistic map of uh, an alternate history of Europe, and then I'd be doing star charts, which are always fun, like the one from Hell's Gate. Cool. So take us through the process of making a map for a, for a science fiction or fantasy novel. Is there a standard way you go about it, or is each one different? Can you give us a typical outline of how you do it? Well, the first thing, of course, is to get the specs on the map from the publisher. And that means getting uh, information on what the resolution will be and what the pixel dimensions will be, because these are going to ultimately go in as digital files. And you have to keep 
a real good track of the scale of what the objects are going to look like in the map when they're shrunk down to a paperback book. And then, of course, the author usually provides some kind of a hand-drawn map that is, well, nine times out of ten completely out of proportion and scale. <laughs> and, and it's completely not the proportion of rectangle that you need. So then you have the challenge of trying to figure out how best to fit that onto one, maybe two pages as a spread. If it doesn't quite work that way, sometimes you invent a little bit of artwork to go around it. And oftentimes these things are, are rectangular and have nice little borders that I try to put in. But, um, for example, in the shadow of Saganami, I did an oval with star fields inside the oval. And then the uh, star chart was mapped out inside of that oval. So that was, you know, kind of fun. Um, and then my approach on these is usually digital. I have done um, handwritten calligraphy on paper and then scanned it in. Um, that's best if you want to make your own f kind of font, if you will, and really make it artsy. Uh, otherwise, I go out and collect a lot of fonts from the internet and have them available on the computer to use. Um, the nice thing about that is, of course, I can scale them and I can type them out rather than having to place each letter and, and move them around. Sometimes, though, you know, maybe you're dealing with an alien writing uh, or symbols. All of these things I have to invent by either drawing them by hand or digitally creating them. I use a graphics tablet exclusively for all of the freehand drawing when I work digitally. The, the maps all have to be in grayscale, and so I have to be very careful to make sure that everything has good contrast. Um, we have a uh, little bit of uh, ink bleed that's going to happen on various papers. So uh, to make sure that the lines are, are crisp and clean and bold enough, I have to keep account of how thick I make the lines. So there are a lot of different factors to really keep in mind when I'm working on these things. How do you decide on the general look of a map? Well, first of all, I think about what it's trying to represent. Um, I need to get the information that the author wants in there, and that's the highest priority. I can't distort it because the author is giving us a map because he wants us to see the relationship of where things are. There are times when it might require a small area to be enlarged as, as a second map or, or an inset, but uh, I really have to stay faithful to what the author wants and get all of his labels into the picture. The best way to do that is to start playing it around with rotating it and uh, scaling the image and trying to fit it onto the rectangle that I'm given. Now, I'm allowed to shrink my rectangle so it's not so tall and narrow, but if I do that, it looks kind of funky on the page because of the page proportion of the book. So I really want to try to keep the format that I've already been given. Other than that, I try to plan it out with artistic composition in mind because art has to look good, not just show the object. Do you have any uh, favorite or memorable maps that you that you've done for Bain? <laughs> Actually, one of my favorites was uh, in Pyramid Power by Eric Flint and Dave Fisher, and it wasn't your standard kind of map. It was done pencil rendering on a large sheet of paper because it was an oblique view of the Norse cosmos. So there's this land mass floating around in space at the bottom and out from it comes a tree that grows straight up through the picture and there's a spiral that wraps up and around it and that's the world. And it's all nested in the branches and then I had to draw in all of the little features that go with this Norse cosmos and it was just a lot of fun to put all of those things in there as a pencil rendering, as opposed to flat line work with color fields. Um, others have been a lot of fun. I liked doing the star field ones, like in Hell's Gate. And uh, when, when I had to map Venice, that was a lot of fun, too, just learning about the streets of Venice and, and uh, what the city looked like. Is that for Heirs of Alexandria series? Gosh, what was the Venice one? That was for the 1634, the Galileo Affair. Ah, okay. 
it's a lot of fun doing some of the maps of Europe too, but because they're they're based on uh, real history without a lot of alteration to the geography. The uh, you know just the political lines pretty much are changing. Uh, I had to pay a lot of attention to what the area looked like at the time when the story happened, not so much as the the uh, geography looks today, because coastlines change and and uh, people build cities out into the ocean and people dam up rivers and make lakes and all sorts of things happen over the centuries. I want to thank Bain cartographer Randy Asplund for being with us on the podcast. You can find out more about Randy and his other work, which is also amazing and varied, at randyasplund.com. That's R-A-N-D-Y-A-S-P-L-U-N-D.com. Thanks, Randy. Thanks very much, Tony. It's been a pleasure. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles, including many Bain titles, when you try Audible free for 30 days. I've been a subscriber to Audible for years and I really enjoy the service. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has defeated one long-standing enemy, the Havenites, and reached a truce with another menace, the ancient aristocratic Salarian League. But the Salarian League is crumbling, and on the edges of its empire, rebellion is brewing. On a number of planets where Salarian League territory butts up against the wild Talbot Quadrant, now in alliance with Manticore, Partisans are buying weapons from a man who claims to represent Manticore. He is, in fact, an agent of the Mason Alignment, a shadowy organization that is trying to put in place a genetic super race as ultimate rulers by setting the Star Kingdom and the Sollies at one another's throat. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hinka, Countess Goldpeak, who is in command of Royal Manticoran Naval Forces in the Talbot Quadrant, sympathizes with the rebels, but she wants the help she can provide to come at a time and place of her choosing and not that of her enemies. That place is the Saltash system, part of the Talbot Quadrant, but for generations under the thumb of the Sali's Office of Frontier Security. Now a group of Royal Manticoran Navy ships are on their way to Saltash for a show of force, and to let them know that Saltash is no longer a Solly puppet state. Here is part 13 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Chapter 10 Well, Hosea, I hope you've completed your homework assignment, Naomi Kaplan said dryly as HMS Tristram bored through hyperspace 12 hours after leaving Montana orbit. I'd like to sound like I've got some clue what I'm talking about for the Commodore's conference. I wouldn't say I'm happy about the amount of detail I've managed to turn up, Skipper. Lieutenant Hosea Simpkins, Tristram's astrogator, replied with a wry smile. I've pulled everything I could find out of the files, but Tester knows it isn't much. Somehow I'm not surprised. Commander Kaplan shrugged and leaned back in her chair at the head of the briefing room's conference table. Go ahead and give us what you've got, though. Yes, ma'am. Kaplan's Grayson-born astrogator didn't bother to consult his notes. Technically, Saltash is an independent star system. Actually, it's been an OFS client for about 60 T years. The single habitable planet is called Cinnamon. Orbital radius is about nine light minutes. Population's just under 2.5 billion, Planetary diameters only 0.96 old Earth, but gravity's almost a full standard gravity, so it's obviously a little denser than most. Hydrosphere is right on 73%, and its axial inclination's only 9 degrees, so it sounds like a fairly nice place to live. Unfortunately, the local political structure was a real mess 60 or 70 T years back. The Republic of McPhee and the Republic of Lacor both claimed to be the sole legitimate system government, and they'd fought two or three wars without settling things. They were headed towards another war, and all indications were it was going to be a really ugly affair this time around, when the president of McPhee called in Frontier Security to play referee. Where have we heard this story before? 
Lieutenant Commander Alvin Tallman muttered with a scowling expression. I hate to say it, sir, Simpkins told Tristram's executive officer, but in this case, OFS really did end up doing one of the things it was ostensibly created to do. I'm not saying it did it out of the goodness of its heart, you understand, but if the League hadn't intervened, McPhee and Lacour were probably getting ready to pretty well sterilize Cinnamon. That's how bitter the situation had gotten. Any idea why things were that bad, Hosea? Kaplan asked, her eyes intent, and Simpkin shrugged. Not really, ma'am. Given the intensity of the last war they actually fought, these people were as unreasonable as we Graysons were before we exiled the faithful to Masada. But it doesn't seem like religion was behind the antagonism in Saltash's case. The only thing I can tell you for sure is that the two sides had obviously hated each other for a long time, and it looks like they'd simply reached the point of being so pissed off, if you'll pardon my language, that they were ready to pull the trigger even knowing there was a pretty good chance they'd wreck the entire planet. Well, that sounds promising as hell, Lieutenant Vincenzo Fonzarelli sighed. It might not be that bad, Vincenzo, Abigail Hearn said, smiling slightly at Tristram's chief engineer. Fonzarelli looked back at her skeptically, and she shrugged. We're not really here to deal with the Saltashians directly, so it doesn't matter if they're as crazy as the faithful, or even Grayson's. Her smile turned dimpled. All we have to worry about is the OFS presence in the system. That's a reassuring thought, Lieutenant Wanda O'Reilly observed waspishly. The communications officer's resentment of Abigail's promotion and, in her opinion, privileged status, had abated slightly, but it still rankled, and no one was ever going to accuse O'Reilly of giving up a sense of antagonism easily. I could wish we weren't here to confront the Sollies too, Wanda, Kaplan said mildly. Unfortunately, we wouldn't be making the trip if there weren't Sollies at the other end of it, now would we? No, ma'am, O'Reilly acknowledged. So, how much system infrastructure is there, Hosea? Kaplan asked, turning her attention back to the astrogator. Not much, actually. This time, the Grayson did look down at his notes. There's some mining in the Casper Belt between Saltash Delta and Himalaya, the system's only gas giant, although the total belter population, workforce and dependents combined, is way under a half million and there's a gas extraction plant orbiting Himalaya itself. There doesn't seem to be much local heavy industry, though, and the system's only real cargo transfer platform is Shona Station, which also happens to be Cinnamon's only significant orbital habitat. How big a population does it have, Hosea? Abigail asked with a frown, and Simpkins checked his notes again. Almost a quarter million, he said, and Abigail's frown deepened. Something bothering you, Abigail? Kaplan inquired, and Abigail gave herself a slight shake. Only that that's a lot of civilians to be potentially getting in harm's way, ma'am, she said. I was just thinking about how ugly things almost got in Monica. Kaplan gazed at her for a moment, then nodded. I see your point. Hopefully nobody's going to be stupid enough for us to have to start throwing missiles around this time, though. Hopefully, ma'am. Abigail agreed, and Kaplan turned back to Simpkins. Should I take it there's no indication that this Shona station's armed? Not according to anything in the files, ma'am. Then, given the Sollies' well-demonstrated ability to screw things up by the numbers, I suppose we'd better hope the files are accurate in this case, Kaplan said dryly. A flicker of laughter ran around the conference table, and Tallman cocked his head at his commanding officer. Do we actually know whether this Duaneus character is likely to be reasonable or not when we turn up, Skipper? That is the million-dollar question, isn't it? Kaplan's smile was thinner than ever. And the answer, I'm afraid, is that we don't have a clue. Our bio data on him is even thinner than Hosea's info on the star system. Officially, he's not the system's governor. Legally, it's only a courtesy title, it says here. She tapped her copy of the squadron's orders from Michelle Hankey and rolled her eyes. 
But from what Hosea said, when he says jump, the only question anyone in Saltash asks is how high. That's about right from everything I've been able to find, ma'am, Simpkins put in. She cocked an eyebrow at him and he shrugged. Under the terms of the Frontier Security Peacekeeping Agreement, OFS was assigned responsibility for managing the system's local and interstellar traffic, just to make sure no one was sneaking any warships into position for attacks, you understand. Of course, it was necessary for Frontier Security to levy a slight service fee for looking after Saltash's security that way. How big a service fee? Try 35% of the gross, ma'am. Simpkins replied grimly, and Kaplan's lips pursed in a silent whistle. That was steep, even for OFS. Do you know if that level was part of the original agreement? She asked. Or did Duaneus and his predecessors crank it up to give them a better level of graft after they were in place? That I couldn't tell you, ma'am. Sorry. Not your fault. Kaplan shook her head. You've actually done better than I expected, given how small and how far from home Saltash is. I didn't think you'd be able to pull this much out of the files. Simpkin's smile showed his pleasure at the compliment, and she smiled back at him briefly. Then she returned her attention to Tallman. Like I say, Alvin, we don't really have a good enough feel for Duaneus to make any predictions on how he's likely to react when we turn up on his doorstep. Unless he's a fool, he has to have known word of his activities was going to get to the Talbot Quadrant sooner or later, though, so I'm not exactly inclined towards wild optimism about how reasonable he's likely to be. Captain Savala checked with everybody in Montana who's had dealings with Saltash, but he's only held the governorship for less than a T-year. That's not long enough for anyone to have gotten a real handle on his personality. On the other hand... He was sent out here specifically to replace his predecessor after things started going into the crapper between us and the League, and try as I might, I can't convince myself that's a good sign. Well, I guess there's only one way to find out, isn't there, ma'am? Tallman smiled fleetingly. Just once, I wish we could do it the easy way, though. Oh, I do, too, Kaplan told him and then she showed her own teeth in a thinner and far colder smile. I do, too, she repeated. But one thing Saltash is not going to be, people. She looked around the conference table. It isn't going to be another New Tuscany, not this time. Any new thoughts occur to anyone since our last meeting? Jacob Zavala asked. His squadron was eleven days out from Montana, and still four days short of Saltash by the clocks of the galaxy at large, although only eight days had passed by Desron 301's clocks, and his comm display was split into four equal-sized quadrants. Each quadrant was further subdivided into thirds to show the commanders, executive officers, and tactical officers of four of his squadron's five destroyers. Commander Rochelle Goulard, Lieutenant Commander Jasmine Carver, and Lieutenant Samuel Turner of HMSK were physically present in his flagship's briefing room, along with Lieutenant Commander George Auerbach, his chief of staff, and Lieutenant Commander Alice Gabrowski, his operations officer. Now he looked around the faces, electronic as well as flesh and blood, with one eyebrow raised. I've got something, sir, Lieutenant Commander Rutzel, HMS Harris's CO, said. He was a heavyset man with a face designed for smiling, but at the moment, he was frowning slightly instead. Not so much a new thought as an observation, though. Observe away, Toby, Zavala invited. I've been looking back at the information, such as it is, we've been able to pull together on Shona Station, sir. I know none of our data suggests the station mounts any anti-ship weaponry, but according to the best info we have... There's an OFS intervention battalion permanently stationed there. I realize it's probably going to have a lot of its personnel deployed as detachments on Cinnamon and elsewhere around the system, but if they've managed to hang on to any significant portion of that troop strength and we have to actually board the station, things could get ugly. There was silence for a moment. Then Captain Morgan, 
HMS Gawain's CO and the squadron's senior captain spoke. Toby's got a point, sir, he said. Under most circumstances, it probably shouldn't be a problem, but we've already had ample evidence the Sollies are willing to push things way past the point of reason, especially when we don't have a batch of marines of our own to send aboard to help them recognize the logic of our argument. Zavala nodded soberly. You've both got points, he agreed. I'd like to think any responsible officer would recognize the need to stand down when we turn up in strength, but people have different definitions of responsible. And let's be fair here. I'd find it difficult to roll over and play dead if a Sully squadron came sailing into a star system I was responsible for defending and started throwing around demands. And Frank's right about our dearth of marines, sir. Naomi Kaplan said a bit grimly. Holding down crew size is all well and good, and I'm all in favor of the increased efficiency for shipboard operations, but not having any marine detachment for moments like this is a pain in the ass. Abigail Hearns, by far the youngest officer attending the conference, nodded unconsciously in agreement with her CO's observation. She seemed to specialize in being short of marines when she needed them, Abigail thought wryly, remembering a really unpleasant afternoon on a planet called Tiberian, and another, almost as bad, aboard a shattered hulk which had once been the Solarian super-dreadnought Charles Babbage. Never around when you need one, she reflected wryly. Well, aside from Mateo, she amended, thinking about Lieutenant Mateo Gutierrez. There are moments when something more flexible than a laser head seems indicated, Zavala acknowledged. Hopefully, this won't be one of them. We do need to be prepared in advance, if it turns out it is, however. Now, I wonder who among us might be best qualified by experience and training to oversee a little responsibility like this? His tone was almost whimsical as his eyes tracked across the comm display. He smiled as they came to rest upon one of his officers' faces, and Abigail found herself looking back at him. I believe you've had some small experience in matters like this, haven't you, Lieutenant Hearns? What's this all about, Vice Admiral? Damian Duenas demanded a bit testily. He'd been in bed for less than two hours when the emergency comm call came in, and he wasn't one of those people who woke up cheerful. We've confirmed a significant hyperfootprint, Governor, Vice Admiral Oksana Dubrovskaya replied from his display. Gravitics make it five separate point sources. Duenia stiffened and felt his face oozing towards expressionlessness. Merchant ships didn't travel in shoals like that in Solarian-dominated space, and he wasn't expecting any additional Navy visitors, or not from his own Navy, at any rate. "'What else can you tell me, Vice Admiral?' he asked after a moment. "'Less than I'd like to, sir.' Dubrovskaya didn't much care for Duenas, and she'd argued respectfully against his plan from the outset— which was one reason she took such care to address him as courteously as possible. They're headed in system now, but they made their translation right on the hyperlimit, and they're still over nine light minutes from Cinnamon. It'll be another couple of minutes before we can get any light speed sensor reads on them. I can confirm that they're headed for the inner system on a least time course for a zero zero intercept with the planet in approximately. Her eyes moved to the time display in the corner of her own comm. Another 171 minutes, however. From their footprints and the strength of their wedges, CIC puts them in the 150 to 200 ton range, but their initial velocity was 926 kilometers per second, and they're up to just over 3,200 now. That means they're accelerating at 5.6 kps squared, Governor. Duenius looked blank, and Dubrovskaya reminded herself not to sigh. Sir, our Rampart-class destroyers are only half that big, 
and their maximum acceleration rate with zero safety margin on the compensator is only 5.09 kps squared. Understanding blossomed in Duenius's eyes. Montes, he said. I don't see how it could be anyone else with that excel, sir, Dubroskaya agreed. The system governor didn't look very surprised, she thought. Unhappy, yes, but not surprised. Damn, Duenia said mildly after a moment. I'd hoped to get some additional reinforcements in here before they turned up. Dubroskaya stiffened visibly, and the governor shook his head quickly. That's no reflection on you or your ships, Vice Admiral, I assure you. But I'd be happier if we had an even greater margin of superiority. One thing these people have already demonstrated is that they're not exactly likely to be reasonable. Dubroskaya contented herself with a silent nod, although she wasn't sure reasonable was a word Damian Duenia should be throwing around at a time like this. Impounding the merchant vessels of a sovereign star nation and jailing their entire ship's companies without trial or bail, didn't strike her as meeting the dictionary definition of that adverb either, no matter what theoretical justification for it he might have concocted. On the other hand, the decision wasn't hers to make, and she wasn't going to shed any tears about pinning the Manti upstart's ears back the way they needed. Even assuming there's any truth to the rumors about Spindle, Governor, she said, we're not picking up anything that could be transporting the missile pods they'd need to equalize the odds here in Saltash. Those rumors were a lot more fragmentary than she would have preferred, but they did seem to strongly suggest that Fleet Admiral Sandra Crandall's visit to the spindle system hadn't gone very well. The only problem was that no one in Saltash had a clue as to how badly it might have gone. The battle, if a battle had actually been fought at all, had taken place little more than two months earlier, and there simply hadn't been time for any reliable account of it to reach a backwood star system like Saltash. One thing Dabroskaya was confident of was that the stories they had heard, like the ones about what had happened to Joseph Bing in New Tuscany, had obviously grown in the telling. There had to be at least some core of truth to the wild tales of disaster— but the destruction of dozens of SDs while the Mantis got off scot-free? Ridiculous. Still, the SLN had clearly taken losses and, presumably, retreated from the system in the face of unexpectedly heavy resistance, and that was more than bad enough for Oksana Dubrovskaya. The fact that a Solarian fleet had failed to take its objective for the very first time in the SLN's history was a sobering and infuriating thought, and she was determined not to let overconfidence lull her into creating her own disaster, which was one reason she was less than enthralled by Duenas's strategy. She and her staff had analyzed the badly garbled bits and pieces of information they had as carefully and pessimistically as possible, however, and it seemed evident that the Mantis must have managed to get more system defense missile pods into the system than Crandall had realized— They'd probably been longer ranged than Crandall had expected, too, judging by the limited accounts they had. That was the only explanation they could come up with, and as she'd just pointed out to the governor, missile pods in Spindle weren't going to help them in Saltash. I'm glad to hear that, of course, Vice Admiral. Duenas nodded. But I'd like to settle this without an exchange of fire, if we can and having more of our warships in attendance might help assure that outcome. I'd just as soon not shoot myself, sir, Dubroskaya said. If the Mantis are crazy enough to push it, though, they'll soon discover they shouldn't have. I don't doubt that at all, Vice Admiral, Duenius replied. My concerns have nothing at all to do with your ships or your people, I'm just thinking about the political and diplomatic as opposed to the directly military implications. Understood, Governor. Dubroskaya nodded, although the truth was that she was far from certain of exactly what Duenius's political objectives were in this case. Still, whatever his intentions, his orders had been clear enough. He wasn't especially shy about handing those orders out either, she thought, with more than an edge of resentment. 
She'd been a flag officer for over 20 T years, and she didn't enjoy being ordered around by the governor of a single star system on the backside of nowhere that wasn't even officially league territory. Unfortunately, her deployment orders made the chain of command clear and unambiguous. And according to Tucker Kiernan, her chief of staff, Duenas was well-connected back on Old Terra, which suggested that pushing back against his presumptuousness might not be a career-enhancing move, however much the pain in the ass deserved it. What I'd like to do is squash him like a pimple, she thought. But then she gave a mental snort. Not like he's the first arrogant civilian you've had to take orders from, Oksana. And at least the Mantis only sent along light cruisers. However questionable his strategy may be, you've got more than enough force advantage to keep a lid on the situation. Thank you for getting this information to me so promptly, Duenius continued after a moment. I need to confer with my people here in Kernuish. Please keep us apprised of any additional information that comes your way. Of course, Governor. What do you think, Cicely? Damian Duenas asked two minutes later. Probably the same thing you do, Lieutenant Governor Cicely Tielikanen replied from his calm and shrugged. Dubrovska is right. They have to be mantis with that acceleration rate. But why haven't they said anything yet? Duenius wondered out loud. Who knows? Tila Kanan shrugged again. She'd never shown any particular enthusiasm for Duenius's plan, and he felt a flicker of anger at her obvious intention to stand back and make it abundantly clear it was his plan. Maybe it's some kind of psychological warfare ploy, they have to have thrown this together pretty quickly to get here this soon, so maybe they figure we don't have any Navy detachment of our own. If that's the way they're thinking, they may figure that letting you worry about them for a while will soften you up for their demands. Maybe. Twinius rubbed his chin, eyes narrowed in thought, carefully taking no note of the second-person pronoun in her last sentence. Then he gave himself a shake and straightened up. I'd better get dressed. Meet me in my office as soon as you can. On my way now, she said, handing her visual pickup to let him look out the side window of her air car as it sped through the sparse late-night aerial traffic of the city of Kernuish. I'll be waiting by the time you can get there. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 13, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Hank Davis, and to David F. Sherrad for help with editing of the Transgalactic interview. And thanks to March to the Stars theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. Intergalactic gobs of highly communicable gratitude to Transgalactic editors and Bane authors David Drake and Eric Flint and to Bane mapmaker extraordinaire Randy Asplund. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 